Northwest region of the western lobe, but perhaps by winds and aeolian transport, perhaps by sublimation and winds and then recondensation, or perhaps by a process we haven't thought about. But in any case, um, uh, we think that we're coming to understand uh, this feature just a little bit. It is early days. Uh, Bill may have a little bit more to say about that. Um, what I want to talk about next is uh, our next time step, which is a false color image, which has really been stretched to show the dramatic differences in color units on Pluto and how they correlate with the geology. This is pretty mind-blowing. Kathy's going to have a lot more to say about it and what it means in the bigger picture. But as you can see, for example, uh, Tombaugh Regio with the western and eastern lobes that I was just talking about have different colors. They're telling us something in that. And soon we'll have composition spectroscopy to support that at very high resolution. You can see that the polar regions uh, have a different color still and that as we get down into the uh, dark equatorial regions, there's still more information. The geology and the color, probably the composition, seem to be correlated. And this, this tells us that the payload that we brought to bear on the reconnaissance of the Pluto system was really the right payload. Because we have on board the spacecraft now tremendous data sets with higher resolution color than this, higher resolution panchromatic mapping for doing the geology, and a spectacular data set with compositional information with over 64,000 pixels that we've put on the surface to get a spectrum at every location. We're going to be able to tell this story very well over the next year. Really looking forward to that. Um, I'm going to move on to the next time step, uh, tell you a little bit about atmospheric science where we've also made some advances. Uh, this, uh, this particular view graph uh, is to illustrate something about our ultraviolet occultation uh, of uh, uh, Pluto's large moon, Charon. Uh, this was an experiment that we designed years ago to look for an atmosphere around Pluto's largest moon. And there's been a pretty big body of literature uh, speculating about how Charon could have an atmosphere. Uh, we just got the summary data down in the last few days. We don't yet have the full spectral data set. In fact, we won't have that data until September. But if you look at that, uh, uh, that uh, time step, you'll be able to see the little yellow line represents the path of the sun as seen by the, uh, from the spacecraft moving behind Charon. And you see it just clips the northern uh, regions of, of the uh, moon. That's exactly what we plan. That's exactly how we plan this uh, trajectory to go. And just as you uh, clip on either side of the, the, the body, you can see in that red and white graph that the light level from the sun just plummets straight to zero. Doesn't look anything like the uh, solar occultation data that we showed you last week for Pluto where we could clearly see a refractive signature, a slow decline in the light levels. Here, it's just basically a square wave telling us that Charon has much less atmosphere than Pluto, if any. We really can't put strict bounds on it yet because we don't have the spectra. But as I said, we'll be able to do that when we get out to September because those spectra will be downlinked. For now, all that we can say is it's a much more rarefied atmosphere, and that confirms our, our pre-flight notions, our pre-encounter notions, and uh, we're really looking forward to seeing just how rarefied that is. It may be that there's a thin nitrogen layer in the atmosphere, or methane, or some other constituent, but it must be very tenuous compared to Pluto. Again, emphasizing just how different these two objects are, despite their close association in space. I want to also speak to another part of our atmospheric science, which is the fact that we've now got to the ground some of the radio occultation data for Pluto where the Deep Space Network transmitted a powerful signal up to Pluto timed to arrive just as the spacecraft was passing behind the planet so that we could measure the refractive index of the atmosphere. And as you'll hear more from Mike, um, we got it. We got the data. They're beautiful data. And they have a wonderful scientific surprise. The pressure in Pluto's atmosphere measured at the base of the atmosphere for the first time in history is lower, substantially lower than predicted. And that's probably telling us a story, and Michael have more to say about that. I'd like to, uh, to close with one more uh, time step. This is really a spectacular image. This is uh, a silhouette of Pluto looking back after the flyby. I think this is just fantastic. This is our equivalent on New Horizons of the Apollo Earthrise photograph that proved we were there. You can only get this image by going to Pluto and crossing to the far side and looking back now, as striking and spectacular as this image is emotionally, it also represents a huge scientific discovery. 
because you see above the dark disk of Pluto a band of light which is actually telling us that Pluto has a haze layer in its atmosphere, and Mike's going to tell you more about it. Okay, thank you, Alan. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to talk about two uh, new results on the atmosphere that are basically changing the way we think about Pluto's atmosphere. We're having to start from scratch to understand um, what we thought we knew about the atmosphere, the way the weather worked and the way the climate and the evolution worked. So could I have the first time step, please? The first graphic, please? Okay, this is one of our first images of Pluto's atmosphere. Now, this was the image that stunned the encounter team. For 25 years, we've known that Pluto has an atmosphere, but it's been known by numbers. This is our first picture. This is the first time we've really seen it. This was the image that almost brought tears to the eyes of the atmospheric scientist on the team. Could I have the next step, please? Okay, now what I want to tell you now is what you're seeing here. This is the atmosphere backlit by the sun, and the light, the crescent that you're seeing, is light, sunlight, scattered by small particles in the atmosphere. And these particles constitute a haze layer. Now the inset is a cross-section of that haze layer, showing structure. The colors have been enhanced, they're not real colors, just so that you can see that there is structure. There is structure, there's an argument going on in the team whether this is dynamics or chemistry, it's probably both, but the real answer is that this is our first peak at weather on, in Pluto's atmosphere. Okay, could I have the next time, time step, just to illustrate that a little bit more. Um, there's a hint that there is either a layer of haze at 30, 30 miles, 50 miles, or a combination of layers and waves in this region. Those are the kind of things we're going to have to sort out over the coming weeks, and that's going to tell us about the details of how the atmosphere actually works. But the haze is extensive. It extends at least 100 miles above the surface. That is a big surprise. That's five times further than our models predicted. Models predicted that haze particles would form low in the atmosphere where the temperatures are cold, but it's forming high in the atmosphere where the temperatures are hot, or at least hot from Pluto's perspective, um, which is not hot from our perspective. But nonetheless, it's a mystery. That's one of the things that we're going to have to sort out in the coming days. Okay, the haze is pretty. It's, it's a way to see the atmosphere, but it's a piece of a big story that we're trying to understand from Pluto. And that is how the atmosphere and the surfaces are connected. So I have a simple animation to illustrate one aspect of that connection. Could I have the next time step, please? Okay, this shows how methane in the upper atmosphere is broken apart by ultraviolet radiation from the sun into chemical components, radicals and small atoms and molecules that react, trigger a set of chemical reactions that form complex hydrocarbons, like ethylene and acetylene, which were detected by New Horizons. As time goes on, these build up, they become supersaturated, and they should nucleate to form haze particles, which then grow, and eventually they will get big enough so that you'll see a haze layer, and they will fall to the ground. At some point in this cycle, those haze particles are chemically processed to, pr to produce what we call tholins, which are chemically, chemically altered hydrocarbons that have a red color. And we think that that is how Pluto's surface got its reddish hue. And in a minute, Kathy's going to talk more about the color and the composition of the surface. But this is just one piece of that story. It's not a coherent piece yet. There are some mysteries. As I said, we don't understand why there's a haze layer at up to 100 miles altitude. It really is a mystery. Okay, the next story regards surface pressure. And I'll just give you a little bit of context here. Um, in a planetary atmosphere, the surface pressure at any level is a measure of the weight of the air above that level. And weight is gravity acting on mass. So if you know the surface pressure of a planet's atmosphere, you can get a pretty good estimate of the total mass of that atmosphere. And it's important because that's a way of quantifying the global state of an atmosphere. Okay, so I can have a next uh, plot, the next graphic please. Okay, this shows surface pressure on Pluto as a function of time. Now, the units might be a little bit strange to you. They're in microbars. 
A microbar is one millionth sea level pressure on Earth. And the time scale there is from 1989 up to just before the present. Now, what is interesting here is that in 1989, Pluto was at its closest distance to the sun. And now Pluto is moving away from the sun in its very elliptical orbit. As it moves away, it should be cooling. The nitrogen should be condensing onto the surface and the mass should be decreasing. But we don't see that, we see the exact opposite. That has been um, very interesting, uh, nonetheless. Uh, we have been trying to figure this out. Well, what I'm gonna show you now is a new data point, some more information that we have to add to this story. Um, it is just one data point, but I do want to, to um, uh, say it is significant and we are gonna have to figure it out. Okay, so this is, this is it. This is what Rex, the radio uh, science experiment, has contributed to this story. A new data point which shows that the surface pressure is at most 10 microbars. That's an upper limit. So the mass, if you will, of Pluto's atmosphere has changed by a factor of two. It's decreased by a factor of two in about two years. That's pretty astonishing, at least to an atmospheric scientist. And so that's telling you something is happening. Now it is just one data point. Uh, these are early retrievals. We've got more data coming, as Alan says, and there's more to the story. But it's another mystery that we're going to have to deal with over the next few weeks, months, years, and so on. Okay, and now I'm going to turn it over to Kathy Olkin, who's going to talk about the color and composition of Pluto's surface. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. So I'm going to tell you about the color and composition and tie, try and tie this together so that you can understand uh, what we know from this color. Uh, the color is really an indicator of different surface compositional units. So if I could have the first time step. This is that same false color image that Alan showed, and I'm going to talk through it and tell you what we're seeing scientifically and some of the things that we know and we understand from looking at this image. So first of all, you can see the dark region down at the bottom of the image. That's near the equator, and that's the darkest region. And you, if you remember, there's dark regions all around that area, even on the other side of Pluto. And then just above it, it's a little bit brighter and a little less red. And then at the North Pole, you see the bright, uh, brighter ices. So if I could have the next time step, Putting this latitude and longitude grid on the image allows you to uh, help see your, draw your eye to that banding pattern. Now I want to talk a little bit about it because it goes to the complexity that Mike was just talking about, about the atmosphere and the surface and the interaction. Pluto has a very complicated seasonal pattern of transport of ices. Over, it takes 248 years for Pluto to go around the sun. And Pluto has a very eccentric orbit. So sometimes it's much closer to the sun than at other times. Also, additionally, Pluto's north pole is tilted over at an angle of about 120 degrees relative to the plane that it orbits in. All of these factors together um, cause us different parts of Pluto to get different amounts of sunlight. And the sunlight is powering the sublimation of the ices from the surface into the atmosphere. And so, uh, some parts are kind of baked, like near the equator, and other parts uh, receive these condensation of these ices, as you can see on the North Pole here. And so we've got a differing pattern that you can see manifested on Pluto that we understand from modeling of the seasonal, seasonal transport of these ices. But there's one glaring difference in this pattern that I just called out, and that is Tombaugh Reggio. Next time step, please. Tombo Reggio clearly interrupts this pattern of latitudinal variation of colors and brightnesses. Um, and one thing I should add is that those darker regions in the, the story I was telling of the seasonal transport are likely the tholins that Mike was describing that were raining out from the hazes or uh, falling from the atmosphere in the hazes. Now, what's really special about the Tombaugh Reggio region is that we're seeing methane, nitrogen, and carbon monoxide ices there. This is telling us something that we need to understand. On the northern part of Pluto, we see methane and nitrogen, but not carbon monoxide. So maybe what we're seeing in Tombaugh Reggio is a source region for some of these specific ices um, that complicates, in, in addition, the story of this seasonal transport that I was telling you about. We're going to be looking at that in the future. 
As you've heard, we have a small bit of our compositional data down, and we'll get a lot more information when we get the rest down. But we've got some great images, and Bill McKinnon is going to tell us about the geology of this Tombaugh Regio region in near nearby vicinity. Thanks, Kathy. Sure. Hi, everybody. Okay. Could I have my first graphic? Next, please. Well, we'll be looking at the, our fabulous near encounter hemisphere, and there you see it. You can start the animation. And what we have now is a full seven frames of what will ultimately be a 12-frame mosaic at higher resolution, but not even our highest resolution that will come down later. This area um, in the next slide, next Yes. So this area, this mosaic covers in its entirety this vast, more or less flat, icy plain that we have been informally calling Butnik Planum. It's pretty big. In fact, it's just about the size of the state of Texas. And uh, all around the periphery and in the interior of Sputnik Planum are geological wonders. And I'd like to share some of those wonders with you. So could I have the next slide, please? So first, I'd like to look at that orange box, a rectangle that you see at the upper left of the mosaic. Next slide, please. So this is the northern boundary of Sputnik Planum. Now, there's a little scale bar down there, but basically this is about 250 miles across, about the distance between Kansas City, Missouri, and St. Louis, a city which I picked completely at random. <laughs> okay. Okay. Next slide. So I've marked some things here to help, help sort of guide this tour. So most of the picture you see is really Sputnik Planum, and it's famous, or really well known, for having this sort of segmented or cellular structure. We just call it sort of polygonal or poly, you know, almost polygonal uh, terrain. And you can see this really well as you move to the left side of the image where the contrast between the bright and dark shows up. But at the top of the picture, it's really different. There's a rugged landscape there a degraded landscape, and something that to a geologist's eye looks like something that has been very deeply and extensively eroded. And we can tell it's old as well because you can see with your own eye various impact craters of, uh, uh, of large size. But what's really interesting to us is the actual interaction between the Sputnik Planum and this rugged terrain to the top. If you look carefully at the image, you can actually see a pattern that indicates the flow of viscous ice towards the scarp or cliff boundary at the, of the rugged terrain. We call these streamlines, and when you look at these streamlines, which I've marked with those curved arrows that you see there, they look just like, and we interpret them to be just like glacial flow on the Earth. But I don't have to remind you that glaciers on the Earth are made of ice, you know, like in Antarctica and Greenland, um, but water ice at Pluto's temperatures won't move anywhere. It's immobile and brittle. But on Pluto, the kind of nitrogen, the kind of ices we think make up the planet, which Kathy just talked about, nitrogen ice, carbon monoxide ice, methane ice, these ices are geologically soft and malleable, even at Pluto conditions, and they will flow like in the same way that glaciers do on the Earth. So we have actual evidence for basically recent geological activity. Now, if I could just back up for one, in fact, one more thing, there's one arrow all by itself there, it's hiding up at the 12 o'clock position. We can actually see a flow of this, what is probably dominantly nit solid nitrogen ice, flowing through a breach in an old impact crater and partially filling in uh, the interior of that crater. You know, and like Kathy said, we, we knew that there was nitrogen ice on Pluto from spectra, We've known this for years, and we, we imagine that nitrogen was sublimating or evaporating one place and condensing in another place, but, you know, we, to see evidence for recent geological activity is simply a, a dream come true. And I, I want to back up just one, one, one little bit and say, when I say recent, I don't necessarily mean yesterday. I mean geologically recent. But the appearance of this terrain, the utter lack of impact craters on the Sputnik Planum, tells us that this is really a young unit. And we have models of what the 
flux of Kuiper Belt, small Kuiper Belt objects would be onto Pluto, and they give various answers. But the best ones imply that these, the ices of Sputnik Planum and the flow features we see, in fact, I should even point out that those curved arrows up at the upper left there, we can actually see them going around what look to be barrier islands. It's really, to us, a kind of conclusive evidence for flow. But just to get back to the age, the age is only a fraction of, solar, of the total age of the solar system, probably no more than a few tens of millions of years. And what we know about nitrogen ice, what we know of, or can theoretically estimate about the heat flow coming from the interior of Pluto, there's no reason why this uh, stuff cannot be going on today. Okay, so let's go to the next time step. So now we're going to go down to the bottom of Sputnik Planum there and to that uh, orange rectangle, and let's blow that up. This is a very busy scene, okay? And it's a bit bigger than the one I just showed you. So uh, this one's about 400 miles across, so that's like taking a drive from L.A. to Phoenix, although it's not, it's a bit colder than that, <laughs> I suppose. Anyway, next time step, please. So here's some things uh, uh, marked up. Actually, at the very top of the image, you can still see Sputnik Planum. You can still see its polygons. And at the very bottom is this ancient, black, heavily cratered region, which we've been informally calling Cthulhu Regio. At the very right of the image, at, three, at the 3 o'clock position, are a group of mountain blocks, which we discovered last week, and we all informally named Norgay Montes. But in this picture, you can see kind of in the center, well, actually, if you go a little bit above in the center and then towards the left, another range or arrangement of mountain blocks. And these mountain re mountainous regions, two of them, are actually somewhat similar. You, may, you might think the ones on the left are different, but that's just because the sun is higher in the sky when that picture was taken, and so you don't see the shadows quite as prominently. The arrangement and appearance of these mountain blocks is similar from one, one region to the other. So we've given an informal name to this uh, new mountain block uh, after Sir Edmund Hillary, who with Tenzing Norgay first summited Everest back in 1953. The scientifically interesting and fascinating thing about this picture to me is that the Sputnik Planum ice, these mobile ices, seem to have moved and surrounded and embayed the mountain, the Hillary Montes. And in fact, they seem to, they cover up not just or, not just in, in bay and surround the, the mountain blocks, but they extend all the way down, and they just seem to feather out just at, onto the edge of uh, the Cthulhu Regio. And in fact, when you look at it in, in detail, there's a lot of fine structure in the ice between the Montes and the Cthulhu Regio, and a lot of fine structure that is different than the a different scale, a finer scale than the polygons we see throughout most of Sputnik Planum. That tells us that the ice in that intervening region between the mountains and Cthulhu is substantially thinner. And in fact, one more fun thing you can see is that if you look just at the edge of the, of the dark unit, you see sort of circles of, uh, of this bright uh, mobile ice, ones called infilled craters. So there are craters that have basically ponds of this probably dominantly nitrogen ice in them. Okay, so let's put this all together and let's take a flyover from one end of Sputnik Planum to the other. If I could have the animation, please. So we're going to start at the north, and we're going to careen over the cliffs onto Sputnik Planum. There are the ice flows around the islands down there. There are the polygons, well delineated. And as we move into the interior of Sputnik Planum, it seems like the polygons disappear, but they don't. If you look carefully, they're still there. They're just obscured by brighter ices. And in fact, we basically are approaching the region that is super rich in the carbon monoxide ice that Kathy was, was just talking about. Anyway, it's a long flight all the way to the south, so we'll skip over that part and we'll rejoin our, our, our tour here, coming up on the Hillary Montes. And there they are. We're sweeping across them, big blocks, small blocks, and bits. The Cthulhu Regio, the dark, asphalt cone surface, uh, ancient, asphalt, ancient surface on the right. And as we move over the Hillary Montes, uh, one of those big craters with the big ice pond is coming into view. That crater itself is about the size of the DC metro area. And as we move off the Hillary Montes, coming into view over the horizon on Pluto are the Norgay Montes.
Now the screen has gone dark, but there's a whole lot more that we're going to learn about Pluto and its moon. Just as Alan said and Jim said, most of our images, most of our data are still on the spacecraft outbound from Pluto. And we'll be downlinking this in the months, in fact, over almost a full year or more ahead. With that, I'll give it back to you, Dwayne. Thank you. Okay, so now we're going to transition into question and answers, and we're going to start here in Washington, and then hit the phone lines and social media and come back. And Frank, I'm going to give you the first question because your expression uh, is pretty cool stuff, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dwayne. It's Frank Boring with Aviation Week for Dr. McKinnon. Just, I have questions about a couple of things that I saw in the uh, the new disc image. Um, it looks like a, a like a copyright mark just to the west of the uh, of the plane. Uh, it's a big crater, I guess, with some concentric circles in it. If you have any idea what that might be, and then also just to continue on the on the ice flows, um, do you have elevation data uh, as to what's making it flow, and is it flowing down into the mountains? Is the plane higher than the mountains? Yeah, that's, a, that's a couple of great questions. So I think you're probably talking about, there are some circular features I didn't particularly point out in the full disk image, and um, to the west and to the north of, uh, of uh, Sputnik Planet, and of, indeed of, of Tombo, uh, Tombo uh, itself, and those are probably impact craters of some scale maybe 150 or up to 250 kilometers wide. So some parts of Pluto are probably at least fundamentally ancient, even though there may be active geologic processes. And isn't there a few with central peaks? Which, uh, well, those are smaller ones, but I think he, at the scale, looking at the big picture of Pluto, you'd be really looking at the very, very distinct circles. We'd have to look at it. I think he was thinking of the one we informally call Elliott Crater. You can okay. actually even see it in this oh, image oh, there. there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You mean the one just up at the uh, 1030 position off the edge? Is that the one you mean? Or, mm -hmm. or you, yeah. 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 Oh, yes. Th that's another crater. Well, that's, it's not really showing on my particular graphics, but it's another one of these craters that has bright ice in it, probably as a remnant, but it also has a central peak. So the central peak is, is dark, and it's sticking up through, th through a bright ring. And your other question was... Elevation, yes. We have, we, dis, we get, you know, we measure the elevation of some of the mountains by just measuring their shadow lengths. And if we don't have shadow lengths, we use another technique called photoclinometry, which is basically determines the relative slope, and we integrate and determine, and it's called, and we get some estimate of the topography. And we can actually see on the Sputnik Planum that the individual polygonal cells are a little bit higher than the boundaries between the cells by a few tens of meters. Um, and the, but the, the primary technique we want to use is called stereo imaging, and we don't have our data yet to do that stereo analysis. But we are going to get more frames of that mosaic, and then we're going to get a whole sweep from an entirely different set of, uh, of observations covering the whole, basically, of, of Pluto. And we're going to have a beautiful stereo view of whether, over, on the whole, whether Sputnik Planum is high, or low with respect to things nearby. The one thing you can certainly tell, though, just by eye, is that the north, the planum is lower than the cliffs, and it appears at the south, where it's, let's say, it seems to onlap onto Cthulhu Regio, so it's kind of a gradational boundary. Frank, did you have another question? You good? Okay. Uh, we'll go here, and then we're going to go to the phone lines. Hi, yeah, uh, Eric Hamm with Science Magazine. If, if I could follow up with, with, with Bill, um, if I could get you to speculate maybe about what could be driving these flows and embayments, um, and also what, uh, how this source region got there to begin with. Uh, there's been debates, you know, whether this is uh, uh, ices that have accumulated from above, you know, layers of, of frost turning into, I guess, glacier-like things over time, or whether, you know, something is allowing ices to well up from within. So, can you explain how this 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 intriguing spot right in the belly of the planet? got to be there, and, and then what's driving it? Thanks. Well, you, you've sort of answered your own question, but, uh, <laughs> you know, we have a region, a vast region that seems to be truly a reservoir. I mean, it is, you know, we make it, we describe this poetically as the beating heart of Pluto. I mean, the, it may be the supply zone, the supply, the supply hut for the entire atmosphere for a lot of geologic activity. 
Ultimately, how it was formed, you can imagine different things. You could, you could go all the way back in time and imagine it was really an ancient impact basin, or maybe it's something else completely different. We see at the margins to the south, there's a jumble of mountains, there's highly deformed topography. We know that geological activity beyond just the flows that I've been talking to you about uh, have deformed the crust there. We don't really, we can't fully explain what's going on because we've only seen these seven images close up. And so when all of the rest of that stuff comes down and when we get some of this stuff uncompressed on the ground, we'll have a much more complete story. But you can imagine as, as I use the word reservoir, you can imagine with any reservoir, I mean, it could be filled in from the side by glaciers flowing into it. It could be filled in from below. You could imagine that inside the icy crust of Pluto, there's enough pore space and cracks where nitrogen would actually be a liquid because it would be warmer inside Pluto as it is inside all planets with respect to their surfaces. And this reservoir of liquid nitrogen could actually supply the planets. We don't, these are all interesting ideas. And as Michael was saying, it's very early days and we're having, uh, we're enjoying a great deal of animated discussion. Yeah, and I'd, I'd just like to add one thing, which is that these images, no, nothing like these images existed just a couple of weeks ago. And we're sort of reacting to it uh, in almost real time. But what we're learning, and very fundamentally, is that on Pluto, we have a much more uh, intimate and intricate uh, interaction between geology and the volatile transport and the seasonal climate cycles, those kinds of things, that are forcing one another and feeding one another and creating a very complicated and layered story about the planet's history. And it's rare in uh, the pantheon of objects in our solar system that we have seen this kind of an intricate and, and complicated story. I'm reminded in some ways of Titan, uh, for example, but few other examples that are so dramatic. It's, it's, it's brand new. Yeah, I mean, ju just you wait till the rest of those images come in, because I know there's going to be great stuff there. Okay, let's go to the phone lines, and then we'll come back here for social media and any other questions in the audience before we wrap up. And on the phone line, first up is Ken Chang from the New York Times. Ken? If you could remind me of the temperatures, uh, what's the temperature in the Sputnik planet that allows these glacial flows, what's the temperature of the atmosphere at the surface, and then, then higher up with the hazes. You want to talk about temperature, Mike? Uh, the temperature at the surface is about 38 degrees Kelvin, uh, which is um, 380 that's degrees below yeah. zero Fahrenheit. So that's incredibly cold. If you want to talk about the ices, and the, uh, I mean ice temperature, yeah, well, and, but in, in case, even at 38 Kelvin, though, uh, solid nitrogen can creep. And below ground, that nitrogen will warm up a little bit, and it's very sensitive to temperature. So there's nothing physically implausible about so, nitrogen so, glacial flow. On no, not planet. at all. Even if there's just a modestly deep layer in uh, Sputnik planum, you get down t just tens of meters, and it may be much deeper than that. The overburden, the pressure from the overburden of ice can actually change the, the, the properties of the nitrogen because it's getting warmer so that it's, more, it's less viscous and much more able to flow. There may be even conditions where you can get uh, liquid nitrogen flowing below um, a deep layer of ice of tens or hundreds of meters. And that may be part of, the, part of this story as well, but we've got a lot of work to do to, to be able to say that with any confidence. Hey, next up is Irene Plotz, Reuters. Irene? Thanks, Dwayne. Um, I have a couple questions. The first, I think, is for uh, Michael Summers. Um, I think I heard you say that the, um, the surface pressure measurements show that the uh, Pluto atmosphere had decreased by a factor of two in two years. Could you just tell us what that two-year-old data set is and um, how accurate that is compared to what you're getting with New Horizons? Uh, yes, the, the data that I showed, uh, that time plot uh, for Pluto's atmosphere, is based upon stellar occultations where we follow the sunlight behind Pluto's atmosphere and look at the extinction of that sunlight to get a measure of how much gas is there. So we have to use those stellar occultations to extrapolate down to the surface to get a surface pressure. And that's what was done for each of those blue data points that you saw. Um, 